Hi, Dr. Arnson Svarlian. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. I'm, I'm excited to be talking to you. Looking forward to talking about Euripides and Thanks translating. Again. Great. Uh, so you are a, a translator. You've translated numerous works. Um, and your specialty is, from what I gather, Euripides. Uh, you've also translated Ovid, um, Catullus, uh, Sappho. In June 2016, you published a collection of Euripides' plays. This was called Euripides, Ion, Helen, Orestes. There it is. And it was published by Hackett. Uh, so for my listeners, if you're looking for a great, stage-worthy, accessible uh, translation of these plays, you should pick up a copy of Dr. Arnson Sfarlian's uh, work, and that is Euripides, Ion, Helen, Orestes. So I always like to start out by asking my guests this question. What what gravitated you towards the classics, uh, towards the study of ancient literature, uh, towards the study of ancient languages? Um, and secondly, of all things, why ancient Greece? Oh, well, those are good questions. I think uh, with classics, I was um, relatively a late bloomer. I never had Latin in high school, letter of loan, Greek. I, when I went to college, I knew that I liked languages and that was what I was good at. Um, so I, I knew that when I started college, I wanted to take another language because I, I, I had taken French or I was taking French in high school and I kept taking French when I went to college and I really liked it, but I just wanted to do another language because I thought languages were cool. And, uh, actually I give, I credit a friend of my parents for this with the suggestion that I take ancient Greek he just uh, I guess you know this friend was visiting my parents and they said oh Diane's going to college she wants to take another language what do you think she should take and he said oh of course ancient Greek obviously <laughs> and uh, you know casual suggestions made by my parents friends don't always change my life but when they do <laughs> they, I end up you know, going into classics uh, so because I thought well oh yeah ancient Greek that sounds cool I think um, in high school we had read plays by Aeschylus and Sophocles uh, in in AP English you know so I so I remember reading Greek plays in those you know the famous Chicago translation series I think are the ones that I read and uh, and I'd always liked, I'd like Greek mythology. We had Dolaire's Book of Greek Myths when I was little, and I remember I loved the illustrations in that. And actually, to go back to maybe my earliest childhood classical language experience, I remember being at the zoo with my family, and my, my older brother uh, was reading the sign in front of one of the animal areas, and uh, it was for hippopotamus. And and I think he, you know, read it off the sign and then like turned to me and delivered this information to me. He said, Hippo, hippopotamus, it comes from hippos meaning horse and potamos meaning river. And uh, that was, it just, it, it stuck with me. I guess that was my first experience of hearing an etymology and thinking that it was cool. And, <laughs> and it was a Greek one. So, uh, so I guess I would, I would go back that far for uh you know being being intrigued by classics but but yeah when i went to college i um i signed up for greek 101 and um actually i i, I hope i if i hope this can be inspirational to people who are you know having trouble with their latin or greek quizzes i got an f on the very first quiz that i took because i um the uh, the professor said well Read, read chapter one, learn the Greek alphabet, and uh, read chapter one. I'll give you, and I'm, we're going to have a quiz on chapter one. So I, uh, I learned the Greek alphabet. I got that part right. But then reading chapter, chapter one was the first declension or something like that, and we were supposed to have memorized the chart and written it out, and I had just read it and said, oh, yeah, I understand this concept. You know, I didn't, but I wasn't prepared to. So then... I kind of panicked, but um, it turned out everything everything was okay. Uh, um, I I realized I, I learned how to study for quizzes, <laughs> and, uh, and I and I really liked Greek. It was it was difficult and it was a lot of work, but it w but I loved it and it was so rewarding. And then I kept uh, so I kept taking Greek, and then actually I credit Daniel Mendelssohn, who was your guest uh, 
up back in the on the. He's Odyssey. the one who recommended you to me. Was, yeah, uh, and I I appreciate that. Uh, um, but we were classmates in Greek 101, and uh, and then you know for the next few semesters, and I went by the time I was about four semesters into it, he asked me, well are you going to be a classics major? Here we are in fourth semester Greek or whatever it is, or I, I you know, I forget how, uh, maybe it was third semester. And, and I said, Oh, I don't know. I hadn't really thought about it. And, and he said, well, obviously you should, if you're still taking Greek. So, and I thought, Oh yeah, yes. Good idea. So, so I did go ahead and, um, and, um, major in classics. I double ma- majored in classics and English. Cause I had like, as, Almost the second I got to college, I said, "Okay, I know I'm going to be an English major, obviously." So, you know, so that so that was already done. But then I added the classics major because I loved it, and I was perfectly happy just taking Greek. But Latin also kind of went along with the deal, so I um, started Latin, and then and came to came to really enjoy Latin too, and then um, I went on to grad school, and it was kind of it was an easy choice to pursue classics rather than English, although I, I loved being an English major and I love English poetry. And um, But I felt like in classics at the end of, at the end of college, especially if you're just starting with, you know, starting from zero when you're already a college student, by the time you graduate, you're, you're just starting to get to the good part. Like you're just starting to be able to read things and, right. and, uh, um, and, but it's still a lot of work. I just, I felt like I definitely needed more training of reading, reading Greek and Latin. And, uh, so that's what I wanted to keep going to school for. Do you find that, uh, learning these, uh, ancient languages as an adult is, is harder? Did you, was it an uphill, uh, struggle for you? And I'm asking you this question because I now work at a school and I, I am someone who doesn't have any, uh, classical training in Greek or Latin. Um, all that I know is what I know to get by as an English teacher. Um, uh-huh. and I majored in philosophy in college, but, um, I work at a school now that uh, forces all of the students to learn Latin, and they are offering for the first time next year uh, Greek. So the kids will oh, be learning cool. uh, okay. Greek, uh-huh. and um, it'll be probably pretty easy for them because you know their uh, their their brains are developing and, and things like that. Is it hard to learn these languages as an adult? Well, I think. Um... You know, if I had my whole life to do over again, I would have tried to start taking Latin when I was younger. But um, at the same time, I don't at all regret starting with Greek because uh, I think the usual order is, you know, usually people have maybe have Latin in high school. And then if they're really into it, then they add Greek when they're in college. But I thought it was fascinating to start with Greek. And I also think sometimes it's overstated how much harder it is to learn languages when you're older. Um, I think that's not that I'm a great expert in this, but it's true that young children's minds and brains are built to soak up language, you Mm -hmm, know, mm -hmm. and um, so especially if you're, if you want to speak a language without an accent, I mean, it really does make a difference if you learn it when you're a little kid versus versus older. But at the same time, when, uh, uh, when you're older, you're just, you're smarter, you know, <laughs> so you can, right. it, it can give you kind of an advantage. You know how to study, you have the cognitive tools yeah. to, to uh-huh. succeed. Yeah. So I, so definitely, you know, I didn't start any, uh, ancient language until I was already a college student and yet I still really liked it. And, went on with it. So, uh, so it's, so it's doable. Let me ask you before I, I want to get into actually talking about your approach to translation, but, but before we do, cause we're kind of in that spot, I want to ask you how healthy would you say is the discipline right now is, is classics in a good way? <clears throat> well, I don't know. I, I haven't really made a study of it. I mean, it's, uh, I guess you you measure things with like that sometimes with enrollments in classical languages, both in high schools and colleges. And I think my sense of the field is that people are doing a lot of of really interesting work. 
um, I guess the the place where really firsthand I've seen that classics is struggling is that they're just there are there are a lot fewer positions for teaching classics at university level and there are a lot more people coming out with classics PhDs because who wouldn't want to get a PhD in classics you know it was it's uh you know that it's a, a, one of the greatest things you can do with a few years of your life to to study classics so there's all kinds of reasons to want to get a PhD but then once you have one there are um there are very few jobs at the college university level um so and i saw that when I left a teaching job that I had uh, in in 2010, and because uh, I wanted to really focus on on working on translations, and I was involved in hiring the person uh, who replaced me, and it was just it was kind of heartbreaking how many really really good applications we had for this one little job, you know, <laughs> and, and just the the quality of, of the of people that we that we had to turn away so sure. so yeah the job market right now is really brutal but um i'm sure that's true across the humanities it is very true across the humanities yeah so that's so i think it would it would be better if i and sometimes I've, i i think our sort of the status of humanities in our culture isn't what it should be i agree um, with that um, uh but but in terms of actual classicists who are working on stuff there's a lot of great stuff you know there's a lot of interesting stuff being done so in, in that sense it's good so dr arnson Svalian, in an article you wrote you started by saying and i want to transition here into the art of translation into into mm -hmm. what it is that you do and your approach in an article you wrote uh you started by saying that there's more than one way to skin a cat and you said oh, yeah. something else <laughs> that i thought was uh that i thought was interesting um that Daniel Mendelssohn and Emily Wilson, when they were on this podcast, they didn't touch on this. You said the following, and, and this clarified a lot for me in thinking about the project of translation. You were writing about uh, a few of the variables, and you say, quote, each language has its own resources. Each age has its own idiom and conventions. And each translator has his or her own understanding of what and you were writing about Euripides, of what Euripides' voice sounds like in Greek. And then you go on to talk about the way in which translations um, uh, will be influenced and determined to some degree by who the translator anticipates her audience to be. Uh, and you say, quote, the work may be intended for stage performance, uh, for readers interested in becoming acquainted with the classics, or for lovers of poetry, for students struggling to learn Greek and seeking guidance from an English version for students and readers who will never study Greek or for some combination of all of these audiences. So my question for you is, how do you approach translation? What's the balance that you strike? Um, you've translated many Greek plays into English. Um, who's your audience? Who do you translate for? Uh, lovers of poetry? Are you trying to be accessible? Um, are you doing this to, to uh, for stage production, uh, or is it some combination? What's your approach to translation? Uh, yeah, it is. It is a combination of. I, I lost count of how many of the <laughs> different <laughs> possibilities, but it's a combination of several of them. I think one audience that I'm not writing for is I mentioned people who, and one very legitimate reason to write a translation is just as a guide to the Greek or the Latin. And that there's a whole, I'm sure you know, the Loeb Classical Library series, these um, uh, volumes that have like the Greek on one side, uh, the Greek and English on facing pages. Or, I've, I've heard about them. Yeah. And they're, let's have probably, uh, I have some here. That, yeah, the, um, the, they're these little, the, the here's a, uh, David Kovacs, Euripides, Loeb. Gotcha. The, uh, the the Greek ones have green covers, and the Latin ones have red covers. And so the aim of that series is it is it's for people who want to just know what these books say. And either you can either sort of read the read the English, but have the Greek right there to look at. You know, if you know like just a little bit of Greek, and you just enough to want to have the text there and see what it says. Or if you're trying to 
read the Greek, but you want the English there because the Greek is hard and you want some help with it. So, so that, so that series, um, the translations are written to be a guide to the original text. So they're, the goal of them is just to be really clear and to even reflect the syntax of the original text, if it's possible. And, uh, to be um, a crib, which I which I think is, you know that that kind of translation is wonderful because it's it 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 just clearly interprets mm. what's going on in the Greek. So and this is a fine grained focus, like on the on the language itself, and just giving you sort of not a word for word, but almost a sentence by sentence translation. Uh, well, as much as as much as possible, word for word, you know, just like if you're. Uh, if you're just trying to figure out exactly what the Greek is saying, then then the you know the low classical library series or or other other prose translations also have this the same goal. You know, just here's what it is. But um, I'm writing a verse translation because I think a a translation has to be um, if you if you want to if you want to read Euripides, it's other than, you know, if you're already trying to learn how to read it in Greek because you're, you know, you've, you're already sold on the idea that, that Euripides is great and you want to read him in Greek. If you're saying, well, who is this Euripides that I've heard so much about? He said supposed to be such a great playwright. I wonder what is so enjoyable about his work. Then, you know, you would want to read an English version that's enjoyable in the same ways that the Greek is, that's, that's written in verse for one thing, you know, that uh, because... I think the difference between prose and, and and verse is really important. A translation, the translations that I do are trying to, as much as possible, be sort of the same thing in English that Euripides plays are in Greek. So the so, qualia of my experience reading the Greek, you're trying to match that for me. Like if I were, if I if I lived in ancient Greece and I I could actually hear it uh, being read to me, or if I was sitting down with it and I knew and, and I knew Greek, you're trying to reproduce that the qualia of that experience, like the way uh, what it's like to be me reading it. Had I did I speak Greek, that sort of thing? Yeah, uh, kind of. And the and remember, if you were um, the original audience of one of these plays you would literally be the audience. You'd be sitting in a theater. It was so musical. I think it, it's, also, it, it's also important that these were, um, that they're written as performance scripts, not just to be, you know, read, read in your armchair, although, hmm. you know, they can, that's good too. But, but I also um, am writing for one of the other audiences that you mentioned, quoting me, uh, the theater audience. So it's important for, uh, for the language to be speakable and playable. You know, I try to think of what is, you know, what does this sound like if you read it out loud? And of course, since it's verse, since it's poetry, the the rhythm is, is an important thing, you know, as it is in Euripides. And um, also the plays are all musicals. I mean, the songs are, are songs. They were set to music. And um, so I've... Um, the way that I've translated them is to follow the same type of form that Euripides use, used, which is um, all of his songs are composed in pairs of stanzas called strophe and antistrophe. And it's like verses of a song, you know, a, um, a, a song might have five verses that all have the same melody, but, but different words. So strophe and antistrophe are like that, the same melody, um, same melody, different root words. Uh, the music is lost, or all, you know, actually there, we have a little bit of the music for Orestes, um, but we have the meters, the rhythms, and the rhythms of the songs, the lyric meters, are are very different from the spoken meters. The spoken parts of the plays are in iambic meter, so um, for, your, for Euripides, Greek, and for all the Greek dramas, the spoken iambic meter is... It's called an iambic trimeter, but it's it's three ba bum ba bums, three sets of two iams. So, gotcha. so Euripides iambic trimeter line is ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum. It's really uh, 12, 12 syllables mm. uh, four times three. Um, 
but for that, I use the 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 sort of no brainer choice for that in English is to use iambic pentameter because right. that's sort of the bread and butter meter of English. So it's a it's a little bit shorter line than Euripides' line, ba uh, bump ba bump ba bump ba bump ba bump, right. and then plus all the variations that are allowed in that. But then when when the character when the choruses start singing or when often um, uh, many of the characters have solo songs that are that are not composed in st- sometimes they're in st- the strophe antistrophe pattern sometimes they're not especially later Euripides has a lot of monodies these sort of free form songs that don't follow a strophic stru- structure but but when I'm translating those I it's important to remember these are songs, you know, they're song lyrics. They're not just declaimed there. So, you know, so I don't use iambic pentameter for that. And what I, what, what Euripides does is um, the meters that he uses in the songs, the strophes and antistrophes, they're not fixed uh, forms. They're sort of, they're free flowing combinations of different, metrical units like bum pa pa bum pa bum you know or something and um or bum pa pa bum bum you know and and um there are different styles of meter like there's um eolic meters which are similar to like the poetry of sappho or there are other uh meters that are called ionic or or dactylo epitrite there there are different sort of metrical families of types of rhythms but any given stanza is unique unto itself it doesn't follow a fixed pattern it's you know euripides is just um he puts together the rhythms that he wants in a strophe and then he matches them in the antistrophe i don't know what his composition process was maybe sometimes he came up with the antistrophe and sometimes the strophe antistrophe first, strophe second, who knows. When I'm translating, actually, I'll look at the strophe and, and the antistrophe, and um, sometimes I'll try to see which one looks harder and do that one first. <laughs> you know, like in, in, in which one is the content going to be more difficult to work into poetry? And, or in which one is the syntax more complicated or... You know, which stanza do I want to do first where I don't have the constraint of, uh oh, line three has to be bump, 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 you know, that, that, because whichever stanza I do second is highly constrained by whatever I did in the first stanza. And of course, I fiddle back and forth as as I'm going along. And um, in, uh, I think I've sort of drifted away from answering your original question, but. uh, No, this has all been very informative and useful. what what audience am I writing for? But I'm writing for you know for readers, and but also for a th- I hope for a theater audience. And there have been a lot of productions, which is uh, really gratifying to me. I love it when uh, there have been a, a, especially at colleges there have been and there have been some really wonderful productions of these plays. And um, and not just a theater audience, but really a musical theater audience. I mean, ideally the song should be set to music. So when, when I'm writing them, you know, I try to also keep in mind, you know, if someone wanted to set this to music, would it work? Oh, that's great. <laughs> and, and actually that, at that point, it's, I'm sort of out of my depth. It's like, okay, composers, it's up to you now. <laughs> that's a lot to consider. So, yeah, so uh, as a, as a, pro, as a pro stylist, um, how, how, is how do you feel about Euripides's prose style? I obviously can't read uh, ancient Greek, uh, but how does how does Euripides as a poet differ from Aeschylus and Sophocles? Ignoring the themes and and just thinking about the aesthetics in terms of his uh, verse style, in terms of his um, his poetry. Well, yeah, that's a good question, and that um, uh, he definitely has his own his own Euripidean voice. I think it's easiest to contrast with with Aeschylus's poetic style. Um because the t- and and one way um to to approach how their styles are different is to read Aristophanes' Frogs because uh in that he um 
uh, Aristophanes goes down to the underworld because he wants to bring back Euripides because he loves Euripides. But then when he gets down there, he realizes that there's like a competition going on between Aeschylus and Euripides for who's the better poet and who is going to be the like chair of poetry and in the underworld. So they have, he has Aeschylus and Euripides as characters making fun of each other's style. And, um, so, and it was actually, I, I translated part of, um, I, I, I co-translated the frogs with, uh, Mike Lipman, uh, who's at the university of, um, Nebraska at Lincoln. And the, the two of us together collaborated on a translation that was produced at, uh, Randolph college in Virginia by, by Amy Cohen. And, um, and I'm going to I'm going to go back and also translate retranslate all of Frogs for a Hackett volume, which will be kind of different in in some ways, but but uh, in more of a more of a classroom book maybe. Um, but it was really interesting and fun to to come to the Frogs after spent you know I've been <clears throat> translating Euripides for uh, however long it's been I don't know. 20 years or something like that. And, um, and to, and then to read Aristophanes parody of Euripides style and say, Oh yeah. You know, it was like, I could, I could, you I got could, it. I you... could get the joke. Because yeah. I've been, been reading so much, uh, Euripides for so long. Um, but he, when he makes fun of some of Euripides mannerisms, like the, um, Oh, repetitions and his choral lyrics. That that's something that, and this is uh, some of the parody in the frogs is specifically of late Euripides, like you see in um, in the my last book, Ion, Helen, and Orestes. Those uh, the late plays, and um, so aside from you know ways in which you can make fun of it, <laughs> um, I think Euripides, in contrast to Aeschylus, is is more straightforward and. It's uh, it's he's clearer. He Aeschylus likes to create really elaborate metaphors, and his language is sometimes very difficult because the ideas are difficult. He's he's putting things into language that are very that can be very striking and hard to wrap your mind around. And I think Euripides is a little bit more plain spoken and and natural sounding i mean it's also very highly crafted and poetic and just the um it really is songwriting just the the musicality of of his poetry uh but i i guess the the one word answer is he's euripides is is simpler (laughs) yeah my co-collaborator and i uh we were we were talking about this and we actually both Mm -hmm. agreed that it even the english translation was hard it was hard now she does she knows greek but we're both doing uh aeschylus that that we actually thought it was hard it was dense um it is dense and i'll make a, a guess and you can tell me if i'm off here but it seems like in terms of uh, how the two tragedians stand now, it seems like Euripides is is more widely known now. He's more read now, whereas Aeschylus is kind of pushed aside, so to speak. Um, I have a colleague that told me Aeschylus was actually uh, used to teach students in Byzantium grammar, whereas I don't know if that was the case with, with Euripides. Well, I think the... Um uh in the in the Byzantine period, I think all the tragedians were um were were school texts and in fact that that's what's it's influenced which texts survived in the greatest number of manuscripts like which ones became school texts and that's how we've we've ended up having the manuscripts that we do in many cases is because they were they were used for education. Um, but I think I think you're right that maybe Euripides is more coming more into vogue now than than he has been. I remember about maybe um, I don't know if this has changed, but ten or fifteen years ago, I was looking at the um, I looked at the the AP curriculum, I guess for AP English, and it said you know there was a suggested list of authors that people should be exposed to, and uh, and Aeschylus and Sophocles were on it, but not Euripides. Interesting. So, 
um, these things sort of, I think the sort of the great books proponents of the 20th century were more, were bigger on Aeschylus and Sophocles and maybe thought Euripides was kind of frivolous or, or, or something. Kind of a wild man. <laughs> and yeah. And, but in, in antiquity, well, in the, in the fourth century after all three of them were dead, Euripides or all, by them, I mean the the big three, you know, the 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 three well-known Athenian uh, tragic playwrights. Euripides became the most popular after his death, and there were lots of revivals of of classical tragedy in the fourth century, and, and Euripides was um, uh, the most performed and most popular author. And the play Orestes was the most popular play of antiquity, which is really interesting because now it's not at all, um, I don't think anyone ever read it in high school or, uh, maybe you can change this trend. You can, (laughs) do you think it's because we now have the entire, uh, Oresteia where, uh, we now have, so that's like the, what's that? That's the only, uh, trilogy that we have. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you think that might be why we well, read the Oresteia yeah, instead? A, it really makes sense that if you're teaching Greek tragedy, Athenian tragedy, it really makes sense to teach the Oresteia because it's so wonderful that we actually have all three plays of a trilogy, and it's just that one that we have. So how could you not read that, you know, if you want to understand what a trilogy is? Although, of course, an Aeschylean trilogy, Euripides trilogies, we have the titles of a lot of them, and most of them don't seem to hang together the way the Oresteia does, that like, you know, following a single plot line through a single, you know, set of characters through through three plays. Some of them were, you know, maybe on three different subjects, but thematically connected somehow. We don't really know. We just, so, and the Oresteia is, is magnificent too. I mean, it's just, incredible beautiful poetry i've been so, reading it the last three days yeah. and and i'm floored by it um yeah and uh and the thing that i was surprised by was that uh with euripides the uh orestes didn't look anything like uh the oresteia they're so incredibly different and i was kind of shocked by that yeah well and that's maybe why now i think um to many people's tastes you know, they would say, "Yeah, this is shocking. <laughs> it's this. This is a this is a really messed up play. I mean, the people in it are bad people, <laughs> and uh, they have these crazy, wild ideas. It's just a hot mess. Like, why do they? Why do they want to kill Helen? What What good is that going to do? And then, what's with this ending? You know, so it so." Um, it really, I mean, maybe now, it, maybe it has more appeal to kind of postmodern tastes because it is right. uh, so, you know, kind of nihilistic almost. Um, and the and and the characters are really unattractive. You know, they're they're not likable people. It was super popular in in antiquity, and you know, I think it had a lot to do with <laughs> probably the the music too. Um, and that is, there's, uh, we have a, a fragment of the ancient musical notation for Orestes. And I, and when I, when I came to the part that's covered by that fragment, I followed the meters as they are, you know, in the, in the ancient notation, because I thought, well, if, and actually a, a lot of people are doing, there's a lot of interesting work going on now with, uh, ancient music and reconstructing what that chorus from Orestes sounded like. So I thought, well, if someone... If someone wants to reconstruct the music from Orestes and they want to use English instead of Greek, <laughs> they could use my translation just for for that one. Bit. I'll tell our next guest. Our next guest <laughs> actually studies uh, the ancient music of Euripides uh, oh, at great. Oxford. So uh, that's what he okay. does. Well, uh, who's, who's your next guest? Is his it, name is Spencer is Clavin. He's been on the show uh-huh. before. And, um, oh, great. Okay. And uh, that's what he studies. Uh, so, um, uh-huh. But I did want to ask you um, – I actually had a list of things that I, that were that are that are different uh, because I started with the Oresteia and then I read Orestes um, mm-hmm. and and I, the Deus ex machina ending uh, the the abrupt ending the fact that um, the fact that um, Orestes and Electra are these you know kind of messy 
unlikable outlaw type characters. Um, I wanted to ask you why this story, which comes out of a rich mythological, seemingly stable mythological tradition, why is Euripides' version of the events uh, in this in this story um, so inc- incredibly different? I mean, uh, some of the glaring differences include the fact that in the Euripides play, Ephigenia isn't dead. Uh, the play is set after Orestes kills his mother and Aegisthus, but Ephigenia is alive. Um, another striking difference I noticed is that in, in Orestes, uh, the Furies uh, uh-huh. are still with him. Uh, yeah. Some of them have refused to accept the verdict and they end up following him around and haunting him, and he's not completely freed from the Furies. Um, then obviously there's the Menelaus and Helen uh, are there in Euripides' play. Um, that's another change in the storyline, and and Orestes appeals to Menelaus, and then and mm-hmm. then you have Helen and Hermione, and he's got a he's got a sword to Hermione's neck, and then all of a sudden he's marrying her, and it, yeah. it, the ending just can't it just hit yeah. me so fast, and I, I was so confused, and I'm looking back and forth, and I'm as I said, I'm like reading articles about this and listening to lectures, trying to figure this out. Maybe you could give me a little bit of insight. Of why it's so different? Yeah, or? why are they? Why are these stories so different? Um, where did Orestes? Uh, where did uh, Euripides get these changes from? Why did he do this? Was he responding to Aeschylus? Was he was he playing with the genre? I mean, it, it it's not really even a tragedy um, in any way that I can think of. Well, it's um, I guess to start with with that. A trage- a lot of tragedies, a lot of, and uh, all the Greek tragedies we have are are from Athens, you know, and all and all the complete plays are Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides. But there were a lot of other tragic playwrights too. And but even in the you know relatively small proportion of the plays that survived, compared to how many there were, um, not all of not all of the tragedies end badly. Some of them have kind of happy endings and. Um, they're not always about really painful things, you know. So, so there's nothing about. I mean, tragedy. I guess that usually they they tend to end badly, you know, like family members kill each other or something yeah. like that. But, but, but not necessarily. You're so right, the yeah. only the thing that formally makes a tragedy a tragedy is the context in which it's performed. You know, it's at the it's done at the. Dionysia, Dionysia. Yeah. or Lanaya at the you know it's it's performed in the tragic competition at a festival of Dionysus and it follows the formal conventions of a tragedy. It has the dialogues in iambic trimeter and then the chorus. It has choruses and it has anapests. It has I mean um, comedy is different in in a lot of ways, but you know part of part of the differences are formal. You know it has different. Uh, comedy has some different met- metrical conventions, and it has this thing called the parabasis. But, but the um, the definition of a tragedy is really, you know, if if it was put on at in the tragic competition and the, for a festival of Dionysus, and it was entered as a tragedy, it's a tragedy. It doesn't. That's be, interesting. It doesn't have it to be tragic in our sense it, it it could have a happy ending so you know what now, they teach english teachers they teach english english teachers that it's a tragedy if, if aristotle says it was <laughs> right yeah. so, but but you know aeschylus sophocles and euripides they don't care what aristotle that's right <laughs> you hadn't said it yet you know, they're, they're, they're doing it their way and um uh but now as for the version of the story in orestes it seems like Euripides just made all this stuff up. I mean, because sometimes the the tragedians had a lot of freedom to pick any any traditional version of the story that they knew, and there are different competing traditional versions of all the stories of you know the traditional characters of uh, legend and mythology. But and um, but they could also they could also make stuff up. Um, I think that. Um, Euripides' contemporary Agathon was famous for um, not just making up a version of a story, but even making up the characters and, uh, you know, complete, completely inventing something, which is now, you know, that's what all playwrights do. But uh, for the Athenian 
tragic playwrights, usually you would take a traditional story from that had to do with the Trojan War yeah. or, or the royal family of Thebes or, or, or whatever it is. But there was a lot of freedom to, to change things. I mean, even, the, um, even Medea's murder of her children was probably Euripides' innovation, you know, because there were, there were other versions of the story of Medea, but, and his became the famous one in which she kills her children. But, but that wasn't the standard version of the story when, uh, before Euripides wrote Medea. Right, like her children died in some other way in other versions, right? Yeah, the Corinthians killed them or something like that. Yeah, in and, and, and the other versions. Or like, well, all three... All three tragedians wrote versions of the story of Philoctetes, and the only one, the one that survives is Sophocles, but Aeschylus and Euripides also wrote Philoctetes' plays, and all three are different from each other in, in, in different ways. You know, for, in Sophocles, for example, the thing that's exceptional about, about his is that he has Philoctetes living all by himself on the island of Lemnos, you know, which is not a deserted island, they're, they're supposed to be people there according to uh mythology but um but sophocles just said well you know i think this play would be most effective if philoctetes is completely isolated and alone on this island so the audiences were very flexible in what they would accept they can't say oh no you can't you can't say that it happened this way because we know that the real way is, you know, it's, it's, so they were willing to, like the audience for Orestes, they, they knew the Oresteia, that, you know, had been a, a big hit. And um, they, actually, they knew lots of stories about the, the house of Atreus and what happened, you know, after the, when Agamemnon comes home from the Trojan War and, and all that. Um, but they were, any time they went and sat down in the theater, they were looking forward to seeing how this, how the playwright was going to tell the story this time. And they knew it could be different from other versions they had heard. So people wouldn't, I don't think what, whatever else they thought about Euripides Orestes, I don't think they thought, wait, no, it didn't <laughs> happen that way. It happened the way it happened in, in Aeschylus. I think one one thing that now people did get kind of upset with Euripides for being innovative, but it, it, it had a lot to do with his music. There was a change in the style of music in the late fifth century, and it was called it was called the new music, or people now call it the new music. And um, and Euripides was was uh, right in the forefront of, of what, what we call the new, new music with, uh, with innovation. And I, and I think that, as I was saying before, one reason Orestes was so popular might be that people really liked the music. You know, we, uh, if, a, if a play is a hit, especially if it's a musical, you know, there, uh, there could be reasons that people liked it that are now lost to it. Like maybe the costumes were It's kind of like Broadway. Like there are yeah. some plays that we like not for the stories, but for the songs. Yeah, sure. And so, so I think Euripides was, um, I think that might've been, you know, since this was such a really, really popular play, um, as you know, after, uh, soon after Euripides death, it might, you know, maybe people just really loved the music, you know, which was, which was innovative, but, you know, maybe people, but, but, you know, uh, but appealing. There's also at the, when the, when the chorus first comes on in Orestes, there's a dance. And again, if only we knew more about the dance and the choreography, because <laughs> we, you know, we know that they danced, but we don't, you know, we don't have a lot of information about it, but, um, but they come in, um, as you remember, Orestes is sleeping and uh, Electra, his sister, is sort of fretting over him, you know, because mm -hmm. you know she knows he needs his sleep because he's been tormented by the Furies. And um, uh, and the chorus come in, and they're there to express their friendship and solidarity with Electra. But they're making noise, and so they come in and they say, "Okay, we're being really quiet. We're not going to wake Orestes up." And and Electra keeps kind of scolding them and saying keep it down, you know, keep it down. You're making too much noise. And then, and they say, okay, okay, we're going to be really quiet, you know, but you can tell that they're, 
d- despite their best efforts, they keep getting louder and louder, and Electra keeps yelling at them that you know, trying to shush them. And that would have been really to interesting to see. Yeah. So I think there that would probably the dance. Imagine the dance that would yeah. go along with the chorus like that. That you know, like. Here we are, we're trying to be quiet, but we are also here to support our friend. And, you know, they, they just kind of keep becoming more disruptive than they mean to be. And Electra keeps kind of swatting them back. So I, I think that, you know, that would have been a, just a really interesting musical and dance number to watch. But, all you know, all we have are the, are the words of it. So uh, while the Oresteia slowly unfolds, and and as we talked about before, it's well organized and it's the you know the complete trilogy. Um, I found that the ending of Orestes was abrupt. It has that. Yeah. I mean, they call it a Deus ex machina ending, and I and it does seem like that Apollo appears uh, and apparently just resolves all of the difficulties. He uh-huh. declares that Helen has escaped and has become a goddess. Menelaus should remarry. Yeah. Pylades should marry Electra. Uh, Arrest- Orestes should marry Hermione. And he's got like a sword up to her neck. Right. And it's this, like... This this woman that you're holding a, a knife to her throat. Yeah, that you're going to marry her. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <that's... laughs> and it was uh, just like, that's it. Like all the... All the uh, we've tied everything into a little bow. Yeah, and that's well. A lot of a lot of Euripides plays end with Deus ex machina, and um, that was and it is something that um, Aristotle was critical of. He's you know when when Aristotle says, well, the best kind of ending for a tragedy is not Deus ex machina because that's just you're just kind of cheating. You want things to work it work themselves out and not have some god step in and work it out. And then also. Um, Horace, the Roman poet, uh, makes the same criticism. He says, no, deus ex machina, that's that's just the easy way out. You don't want to do that. But at the same time, this type of ending was really popular. I mean, Euripides used it a lot, and he was not, you know, and and, uh, Sophocles and Aeschylus also have gods appear. And and, uh, so it doesn't seem, I think if we just take the plays on their own terms, it's hard to if it's hard to have any sense that Euripides himself thought of Deus ex machina as like the easy way out or a sort of cheap cheesy way to end a tragedy because if you know because he was he was good and he knew what he was doing and and he used this type of ending over and over and uh, so I think it was you know for the playwrights themselves and for the, and also if the audiences thought that that was a cheesy way to end a play then you know those plays wouldn't have been popular and and yet they were so that so it didn't so deus ex machina type endings didn't seem to bother the playwrights or the or the audiences of classical athens um the uh just to kind of back up um and explain deus ex machina it's the the god from the machine that's that we use the latin because uh Horace kind of popularized it. Um, and the machine is the mechane, that, which was a crane that um, it was just part of the stage machinery in Athens. And it, it, someone could, you, if you want a character to be flying, they could fly on this, on this device. That makes sense. So, so you'd have a, you know, a god fly in on the machine or sometimes, sometimes literally it's not ex machina. Sometimes, you know, the god might just appear on the rooftop or, or something like that. But if you want them to fly, they could be they could be <laughs> on the on the crane on the mechane. Um, I think that you know Greek Greek literature and Greek culture and Greek religion took the gods really seriously. So if a god shows up, it's it's important, you know. So uh, so I think um, the like um, Apollo shows up at the end of this play. Athena shows up at the end of Ion. It's uh, well, Medea, a chariot shows up to fly her out of right, there. Right, right. <laughs> and uh, um, I think that that a god showing up at the end of a play is actually a serious, momentous moment. That that momentous moment sounds kind of lame, but <laughs> it's uh, it's not. Uh, it's not just a cheap device. It's something really impressive. If a god is going to actually step in and get involved in something 
that's happening with people. So I don't think that the Athenians would have would have thought, oh, how come you know, how come he brought Athena in? Why couldn't he just have people work things out on their own? Or at the end of uh, Andromache, Thetis, the sea goddess, shows up and explains what's going to happen and. That doesn't seem disappointing. That seems amazing. Right. Wow, that is. <laughs> you know? So uh, now Apollo's kind of a special case because he's, um, you know, he's the one both in Aeschylus and in Euripides' um, Orestes. Apollo is the one who made Orestes kill his mother, who right. who impelled him to do that, and that's a pretty terrible thing to do and then you know also in both plays Orestes is tormented by the Furies because he killed his mother that's a that's a terrible thing that's what they're there for yeah and he he was doing what a god told him to do and Apollo doesn't seem to have his back very much it's uh (laughs) I agree with you um let's see Oh yeah, Orestes is talking to Menelaus. Shows up, and he and he's he's hoping that his uh, his uncle will kind of help him with this with this situation. And uh, but he ends up not helping. No. Uh, but Menelaus says, um, "Well, has it helped at all, avenging your father?" And Orestes says, "Not yet. Apollo's going to help, but nothing. You know, Apollo has. You know, here I am. I'm about to be." Uh, and the other thing that's different in this play is Orestes and Electra are on trial for matricide because the, the people of Argos have decided that they're criminals and they're right. going to be sent to death. And, and, and so Orestes is already kind of bitter that, uh, that Apollo got him into this situation and doesn't seem to be helping him at all. And then, you know, he does show up at the end, but it's, um, but yeah, there, there's something kind of, uh, that line of reasoning seems to work better in Aeschylus, in the Oresteia, the idea that a god prompted me to do this. You mean it makes it's more of a justification? Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. And also, the and, and in the Oresteia, you don't have this idea that Orestes is, he's being tormented by the Furies because that's what happens. You know, if you if you kill your own mother, your the Furies of your mother will will pursue you. But then he goes through a religious purification and then there's the trial and, and everything is worked out, uh, by, by civic institutions. And, uh, but here, yeah, he's just, um, he's an, he's an accused criminal and, uh, and the people of Argos are gonna, are gonna punish him for that. So it's, so it's different. Um, but, it, but yeah, in, in, in both cases, Apollo is just, you know, gets him into this, but can't really, well, I, I actually, I, Apollo is the one who, who can purify him. But, um, but in this play, Apollo is really not helping much at all. He shows up at the end and says, okay, you're going to marry Hermione. And, and, uh, but uh, Apollo is kind of, um, in, a, in, in several of Euripides plays is, is not a very likable God. He's, um, at the end of, uh, Andromache, um, the messenger comes to report how Neoptolemus has been has been killed by the Delphians, and um, the messenger says that um, you know de- describes the murder of Neoptolemus, and then he says, uh, uh, "The Lord of Prophecy, who judges mortals according to the justice of their actions, did this to Achilles' son, who was making amends. Hmm. The god held on to grudges like a mean and petty man. How then can he be wise? So here's this character, the the messenger, who's being openly critical of Apollo and saying Apollo's, you know, just being just being petty and vindictive. And uh, um, or in in Ion, Apollo is actually we only know him as a rapist. You know, he's the one who. He's the he's the father of Ion, and Ion has grown up as a as a servant of Apollo in Delphi, not knowing that Apollo is actually his father because he raped Ion's human mother. Um, but he he reveres Apollo, and then when this strange woman comes and tells a story of how, you know, many years ago Apollo raped this Athenian woman, he's really shocked. You know that that, that the god he's he's always. Um, has revered his whole life 
would do something like that. And he says, well, you know, if all the gods, Zeus, Poseidon, Apollo, if they all had to pay restitution for their rapes, you know, it would it would empty out the treasuries of all their temples. <laughs> you know, they should. <laughs> he's so so. People in Euripides are often judgmental of gods, and the gods often don't come across very well. But it seems like especially Apollo, even in Alcestis, Apollo is the benefactor of this guy Admetus. So to do him a favor, to show his gratitude to Admetus, he says, "My reward to you is that." You don't. You won't have to die if you can get someone else to die for you. And uh, <laughs> it's so very Game of Thrones. Just, oh, okay, great. You know, and then he asks his parents if they'll die for him, and that just makes them mad. You know, <laughs> rightly so. And then he gets his wife to die for him, but then he realizes that that was a horrible mistake. You know, so Apollo. But so, but this is Apollo trying to be nice. Uh, but he he gives um, you know this this favor. He bestows this gift on Admetus that actually just uh, turns out very badly for him. So let me ask you a question about um, the about justice in in Orestes. Um, mm-hmm. Orestes is set several days after the murder of um, Aegisthus and Clytemnestra, and the story mm-hmm. tells us uh, what Orestes and Electra are doing after the murder. Um, in this play, Orestes' grandfather, uh, and I, I don't want to mess this up, Tin, Tindarius, Tindarius, yeah, mm-hmm. uh, says that Orestes um, shouldn't have killed his mother, but should have taken her to court instead and let basically okay. let judgment work itself out, let the judicial process work, put her on yeah. trial. Um, but it's interesting in the Orestia, um, in the in the last play in the Humanities, um, this murder, uh, this violent act was basically the impetus for the establishment of a justice system, a court system. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, there's no justice system when Orestes takes his revenge there. Um, so you just have this pure moral dilemma. Um, in Euripides' version, it seems like Orestes is is more guilty. Uh, we, don't, we don't feel as bad for him having to make that choice because... Uh, in this case, he could have let the justice system work. Um, I don't know. Ele- uh, Electra and Orestes just don't seem to be as noble uh, in in this play. Yeah, they're not. They're um, they're yeah, desperate. They're, they're messy. Yeah, they're they're not that likable, and they and and Electra's really she she seems sort of needlessly mean to Helen and. Uh, yeah, and the and the legal system seems to already exist. Whereas, yeah, in the in the Oresti, it's like this is the reason that uh, the murder court was established on the uh, on the Areopagus. And uh, now it's just yeah. The, uh, Tyndarius says, "Why didn't you just <laughs> why did why did you kill her? Why didn't you just uh, sue her or something?" <laughs> or, 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 um, so should we should we agree with Tyndarius? Yeah, that Orestes shouldn't have done it. Well, I guess. But what he's ignoring is that he is that Orestes was provoked by Apollo. So. I know that's true. <laughs> so let's talk about the Medea. Um, oh, okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. Should I say Medea or Medea? Well, either like Medea is more like the Greek pronunciation, but everybody says Medea, so. Okay. I guess I, I say when I say I always say Medea. So, do you think that uh, this is just a this is a personal question, uh, just something that I was wondering if you would touch on? Do you mm-hmm. think that? Um, and I actually grew up watching Jason and the Argonauts, so at least oh, yeah. a the little. Harry Houghton with <laughs> yeah. the, with the yeah. skeleton. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Um, so I had, I guess, a cursory sense of who some of the characters were, even though Harry Housen wasn't going for accuracy. Um, do you think Jason's abandonment of his wife, Medea, has something to do with the fact that Medea is so utterly dependent on Jason? More so, I think, than it's she's unusually dependent on Jason, given that she has to flee home. She kills her brother. She can't go back. Um, she's cut off from her society, and in a way, her entire future is dependent on Jason. She can't return home to Colchis. Um, in other words, because she betrayed her father and killed her brother, um, 
in a way she she is vulnerable um she's she's kind of psychologically vulnerable uh and physically vulnerable do you think that that might have something to do with the way that things played out you mean does that make jason more guilty or uh... um does is she an unusually vulnerable female character despite all her power um another way uh -huh. of saying this is what do you think of medea <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that I think she is she is unusually vulnerable because she's been taken away from her home and also you know burned her bridges because she she killed her own brother. I mean she says so she she's completely cut herself off from her family by um you know stealing from her father and killing her brother and uh so she can't she cannot go back to Colchis, which is also really really far away so she's in a completely foreign land and she doesn't you know she says to the women of corinth um you got you you have each other you know you you're part of the community here but i'm just this weird foreigner who doesn't fit in right. and uh yeah if um that's why when when Aegeus comes and she has that conversation with him and she realizes that she'll that he will welcome her in Athens like that's what she needs to know to do what she's going to do because now she knows that she does have a refuge otherwise it would just be yeah she'd be she'd be a complete exile she would have no home and no one to take her in but once she finds out that Aegeus will take her in she you know she does this terrible deed um but yeah she's she's really she is really vulnerable because she's you know she's pinned everything she gave up everything for jason mm -hmm. and she you know committed a series of crimes and murders that you know make her sort of unwelcome and in other places and then she's betrayed yeah and so that, yeah so i wonder i i did want to ask you this too i wonder how are we supposed to take Medea as a character? How, how do we are, as an audience, are we supposed to be sympathetic to her, or are we supposed to just say it is what it is, sort of descriptively, or are we supposed to be disgusted by her? I mean, she she kills her brother, yeah. Jason's father, uh, Glocky. Creon, the king of Corinth, and her own children. Like, how yeah, yeah, and of course, I think we. It's. I think it's both. I mean, we we are horrified by what she does, uh, because yeah, she she kills her own children. That's an almost unimaginable thing. Who would who would do that? That's puts you know that puts the tragic in tragedy in in our sense, and um, uh, and. She kills, yeah, Creon and Creon's daughter, and they, you know, they didn't really do anything wrong. I mean, it's it, it's it's Jason that she has every reason to be mad at, and I think what um, I think Euripides also makes Jason uh, pretty hateable. You know, he's yeah, he's a pretty get, pet, bad guy. He's first of all, you know, what he does is terrible. She gives up everything to help him. He gladly accepts her help uh but then he dismisses her and and rejects her and then when he talks to her he's he's very condescending and mm -hmm. unpleasant and says oh you should be grateful that i took you out of that barbarian place in Greece, which is so much nicer you know and 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 uh so it's it's easy to hate him and this is another thing i think that euripides does especially well is that he he can create characters who are just the worst, as as Euripides says, you know, who are just really horrible people, and uh, you know, and he he can capture the the sort of subtle ways in which they're just such jerks, you know, and so, and and Jason is a good example of this kind of characterization. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there's not much to like with him, and so you can understand why why Dia. Is so enraged at him. Also, in terms of you know, he is, he has committed serious crimes in terms of Greek culture and religion because he's a, he's a betrayer of oaths. You know, Medea calls on Zeus, the enforcer of oaths, and um, 
so what he's done is, um, you know, he's not he's not just a jerk. He's also an oath breaker, and the gods defend that kind of thing. And um, so, yeah, Medea is uh, she's much more. She's she's very she's she's likable and she's smart. And we also can, we can admire also how good she is at manipulating people. And I don't know whether whether um, whether admire is the right word. There might be might be a question too. But everyone, you know, the the play is just a whole series of people come to her, and and in turn she's able to manipulate each one to get what she wants from them. Like the um, the chorus. They're the women of Corinth, and she gets them on her side by appealing to what it's like to be a woman. Right, and uh, and they, and they they are on her side. They, she says, you know, listen, do me a favor, you know, don't just don't say anything. If I if I come up with some kind of plan, you know, uh, help me help me keep my secrets, and then. Um, Creon shows up, and and she kind of sweet talks him too. She says. Because she's smart, she says. Well, you know what it's like. You know what it's like to be smart. People don't like you. They don't trust you. It, you know, it's 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 rough being an intellectual surrounded by idiots. And Creon says, "Yo, oh, yeah, you know." <laughs> Who she, wouldn't eat that she, up? Yeah. Yeah. So she uh, she appeals to him as like as a, as a fellow intellectual, and 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 she gets the one thing she needs from him, which is just this just one day to to carry out her, out her plan. Mm-hmm. And even Jason. You know, then she finally kind of loses her cool and 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 blows up at him. But 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 she's able to manipulate him too. You know, she she always um, she knows how to how to push people's buttons and how to yes, she does get what she wants from them. And um, at the same time, she you know she has a really legitimate grievance against Jason. And I, I, it's hard not to be on her side in this. Um, you know, in, in in this play, and then that it makes what she does all the more horrifying. So she's like a hero in a Quentin Tarantino film. She's like this is like Kill Bill. You know, she there's a lot of murder and death, but we kind of get it in the end. We we kind of understand yeah, but, the rage. Yeah, although not I don't I don't not her own kids though. She's like Tarantino ish because or I mean because what she does comes from a very deep conviction inside her that that her children are going to die and if anyone's going to kill them it has to be her and also so that's part that's part of it the other part of it is that that's what will really really hurt jason the most yeah. is to kill his oh, children. Yeah. she wants to really really hurt him so there are these there there are both of these reasons so i think it's i don't know i guess i guess i think of Tarantino characters as, as uh, you know, not not quite having that kind of depth. You know that they're just uh, acting in the interests of mayhem. And <laughs> but uh, but she has, but Medea has really deep reasons for for doing what she does. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. So, in an introduction to one of your books, Robin Mitchell Boyask uh, writes, in general. Euripidean scholars advocate one of two main positions. Either Euripides was an exponent of traditional Greek values and beliefs, or he was a radical who subjected all aspects of his society to a withering critique. Medea seems to offer ammunition for both sides of this split. Do the experiences of Medea expose the oppressiveness of patriarchal Greek culture, or do they affirm every negative Greek stereotype about women? The arguments are as endless as they are rich. So this brings to mind a question, which side of this fence do you come down upon? Well, I think it's, um, um, I don't know if it's a absolutely one side or the other type of fence. I think, um, I, th- I think in the, in the question of was Euripides a, a traditionalist or an innovator, I th- I think I'm more on the side of uh, that he was a traditionalist in terms of the of um, 
oh the way he the way he presents the gods and i think there's not sometimes uh there is sort of a, the a, like stereotype of aeschylus and sophocles as the traditionalists and then and euripides as this wild ass innovator <laughs> that's the stereotype i've heard yeah, and I think that's 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 pretty exaggerated because a lot of a, a lot of things and a lot of things that people point to in Euripides as being so radical and modern and innovative are are really in their own way very deeply traditional. So, and now in terms of the was Medea does she expose does she represent a critique of the patriarchy or does she just show how horrible women are? Um, that is an, that is an interesting question. I mean, definitely the, the, uh, the critique of the patriarchy is there. I think they, I think that Euripides completely shows how difficult a position women are in. Um, at the same time, he is, um, I mean, he he she's she's a dangerous woman. So she's a sorceress. Say, yeah. So if you say that this classical Athenian society has deep misgivings about women and thinks they're scary and dangerous, hmm. yeah, uh, Medea Medea is an example of that. Um, I think that you know Euripides. There one another way that Aristophanes made fun of him was by saying that all the women of Athens in the play Women at the Thesmophoria, um, Euripides tries to infiltrate this women's festival because he's heard that all the women of Athens are just out for his blood, you know, and that they, they're going to they're gonna, um, uh, try to punish him in some way because he portrays women so negatively in his plays. Um and he's such a misogynist. And that, but then it turns out that the women, you know, once 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 you get into this festival, the women are, you know, ten times worse than than any misogynist's wildest dreams. You know, they are just drunks and <laughs> adulteresses, and, and you know. So, um, but I think the the idea that Euripides is a misogynist that that women would be mad at him because the women he portrays are so evil. I think that's kind of silly too. I think, I think yeah. Aristophanes is deliberately saying that to be funny because, uh, Euripides women characters have, have a lot of depth and, uh, they're, you know, if, if, uh, I guess the, uh, the other side of that argument is that Euripides is really a feminist because he shows such insight into women and he writes women characters so well. Um, there, there were some lines in in Medea about, you know, you know, you went off to fight in the war, and and you're holding up civilization, but here I am giving birth. That, right. Yeah. You know, I'd, something I'd rather, like that. I'd rather stand behind a shield three times than give birth once. That's incredible. And, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's a that's a good point. <laughs> There's uh, that. Uh, yeah, they. Um, men think we have it so easy, but yeah, try, try going through childbirth. So yeah. And, and Euripides, um, in many ways seems to, I mean, he's, he's good at writing women characters and women feature so, uh, prominently in his plays. He has, he has a lot of, uh, a lot of the choruses are uh, more of his choruses are women. And, um, a lot of his most sympathetic characters are women like Hecuba another one yeah and um so yeah i think he was just someone who of the three great tragic playwrights of athens i think he had so much insight into the way people act and the way they talk and and the way they think and i think that his he gets inside the heads of of his women characters as well as his uh male characters yeah, I think so too. Uh, and in fact, before I even read any of uh, Euripides, um, uh, I was 
I had a discussion with uh, a woman at a dinner party who was trying to convince the whole table that Euripides was a feminist and she was telling us uh-huh. all about Medea and I hadn't read it yet. So I was doing this and, uh, but I, <laughs> no spoilers, no spoilers. Yeah. <laughs> but I, uh, I wanted to ask you one, uh, last question and I just uh-huh. wanted to ask a little bit about, um, Euripides life. Um, one of the things I read about him is that, uh, and this is actually coming from the Encyclopedia Britannica, but I don't know how accurate this is, um, is that Euripides was not very successful in his life. Um, He was only ever awarded three first prizes at City Dionysia, the the article said, uh, whereas Sophocles had won 24 victories, as many as 24 victories. um, The numbers are different. The numbers are different. I think we know it was either... It was either three or five victories in his life, and we don't know what all of them were. And then he got a posthumous first prize for the um, the trilogy that included the Bacchae. I heard and, about that, and, yeah. Um, and we know that one of his first prizes was for Hippolytus. But, yeah, not not to cut you off, but... but um, uh, but, yeah, compared to Sophocles, he was not a big first prize winner. In the in the Encyclopedia Britannica, I'll, I'll quote them. It is often said that disappointment at his play's reception in Athens was one of the reasons for his leaving his native city in his old age. I wonder if that's think, true. Well, yeah, I think I think that that's a little bit now of a sort of old fashioned take on Euripides' biography, and and uh, a lot of work that's been done since then. Uh, that for one thing, there's a lot more skepticism about ancient biographies than there used to be. And um, partly f- based on the work of Mary Lefkowitz, who wrote, you know, she, she uh, has written about how the ancient biographies are, you, you really just can't take them at face value. A, lo- a lot of the stuff in them just comes from inferences made with no real basis on the author's own work. And uh, supposedly Euripides did left Athens um, late in his career and went to um, uh, went to Macedon at the invitation of the king up there. But even that has but that's been doubted too. We don't we don't really know. It, sadly, we we don't know a lot of biographical things for sure about the poets. And we know that we have these traditions, but we know that a lot of that stuff is probably made up. But in terms of um, him being sort of a, a loser compared to Sophocles, that's, <laughs> that's not really an accurate way of looking at it either. Actually, to, to quote Robin Mitchell Boyask again, or to, to refer to him, he does a good job in the in- introduction of sort of debunking that point of view, because it's like, I mean, the, the, the uh, tragic, the, the dramatic festivals were a big deal for Athens. You know, they were they were a really important festival. They had really big audiences. The city really threw a lot of resources at putting on these festivals. But for each um, uh, festival, only three tragic playwrights got to compete. It was called get you know um, getting a chorus. So you had to, just to be in the festival in the first place you had to be one of only three who made it to that level and there were lots of tragic playwrights in Athens so I think Aeschylus, Sophocles and Euripides were were the three who consistently would be granted a chorus and given the opportunity to put on a play so even if if um, even if you don't come in first it's like saying oh man, I went to the Olympics and all I got was a bronze medal. Yeah. You know, it, 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 it was a pretty big deal just to, um, you know, to, to be in the festival in the first place. And, uh, and it's true that Sophocles won a lot more. But on the other hand, even the judging itself was had a, a little bit of a random element because the judges would... Um, would would vote, but they would you know put their votes in a in an urn. But then not all of the votes would be ca- counted. It was it was sort of randomized that way. So maybe it you know maybe it was like a sampling error or so, you know maybe, maybe uh, it it might have been slightly luck of the draw that that Euripides didn't 
win as often. I mean, and maybe, you know, or maybe Sophocles was more of a judge's favorite, and but audiences still liked Euripides, you know, uh, I mean, certainly the opin- opinions, the popularity after their death, Euripides wins that contest. And then, you know, as I was saying earlier, by the time you get to the 20th century, he's sort of lost again. But I think maybe he's maybe he's pulling ahead once more. Um, but he was definitely a, a very popular playwright with, a, with with a lot of success. So um, so the idea that he that he left Athens in disappointment that that doesn't really that doesn't really make sense because he was you know, and active and, and producing and consistently, you know, getting picked to be in the festival. Thank you so much for being on the program. Um, and I, oh, I, I, I wanted to get your take on, uh, on one other, uh, minute detail. I, uh, I was, I was doing some research and I was told that it's possible that, that Aeschylus did not write Prometheus bound and then okay. I, I was at work. We were doing a nature walk, and this Latin teacher told me he is he is sure that Aeschylus wrote uh, Prometheus Bound, uh, that it was not his grandson or whatever, but that he did indeed. What do you think about this? Well, um, the, I think now the consensus. Well, hmm. I mean the. The argument that Prometheus Bound is not really by Aeschylus it was made by um, Mark Griffith, oh. and um, and he makes a strong case for it based on the language and and the style, and I think that that point of view is pretty well accepted. I mean, I I, th- I think that um, as yeah, as far as as far as I know, people have accepted that Aeschylus probably didn't write Prometheus Bound, but I'm sure that yeah, I'm sure there are people who would, you know, still argue both sides of it. The other thing is that one of Euripides' plays is considered by most people probably not to be by him, and that's Rhesus. Oh. Um, so these things can happen, you know. That uh, it, it is possible that. Um, that a play that the tradition would misattribute uh, a work to an author, but that's uh, yeah, I don't know, I don't, uh, <laughs> I don't really have a dog in that fight. I haven't. Really, uh, <laughs> gotcha. Again, thank you so much for being on the program. We really appreciate it, and uh, thanks a lot. Well, it was my pleasure. I love talking about Euripides, and uh, thanks for being such a great interviewer. Thank you for your time. Okay. Okay, Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.